ladies and gentlemen. Today in this episode, we are joined by David Politis, the prolific author of numerous works, the mastermind behind the Missing 411 series, and the creator of the new Missing 411 documentary. Welcome to the show, David. Hey, thanks a million, guys. I appreciate being here. So I guess the, the first things first, if we want to file it under that category, uh, for everybody listening out there, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the missing 411 phenomenon, which began as a book series, is that correct? Correct. Uh, I'm a former police officer, spent 20 years in California, in municipal department there, and after I left, I started to do, do some research in a national park, and some two national park rangers knew me from other books I'd written. They were following me around. Uh, later on, I left the park, went back to my room, Independently, they each came back and went to the room, knocked on the door, and said that they had something to tell me. And they knew who I was. They knew I had the investigative work I'd done in the past, and they said, uh, we have a story for you. And uh, what they had said was is that they had worked at other parks, and they had worked other missing persons cases in those national parks. They eventually got together. They talked about, compared notes at the park that they were at. And they thought there were some peculiarities there that needed to be looked into. Namely, during a search, during that first seven to ten days that someone goes missing, there's a lot of publicity, there's a lot of press, there's a lot of people looking for the missing person. At the end of that seven to ten days, there's nothing. Everything stops. There's no follow-up. There's no investigation. There's essentially nothing more that happens. And when they looked into it, they thought that the locations that these people went missing were odd. Uh, many of them went missing in places that weren't deep in the woods, but uh, might have been fairly close to the center of the park or a populated area or a location where a lot of people should have seen what happened. Hmm. And they, the more they looked into it and the more they tried to find out information, they were stymied themselves. They couldn't get some reports. And they thought the whole thing was just strange. So I said I'd look into it. I left the park the next day, called a couple law enforcement friends. I said, this is what I heard. See if there's any validity to it. You know, later on, they called me back and said, wow, there's something here. There are a lot of disappearances, and there's not a lot of follow-up, and there's not a lot of information available. So the National Park Service has a contingent of National Park police officers, and they're all trained at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. They get outstanding training. It's a big department, and we knew that if we filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests against the National Park Police, this could be a jump-off point for our investigation into these missing people. So the first thing I did was filed against them for a list of missing people, and within six weeks, I get a notice back from them. An attorney calls me from the Park Service and says, why do you want the information? And I know from reading the Freedom of Information Act, they can't use the rationale behind why you make a request for determining if they're going to give you the information or not. Mm -hmm. And I told him that, and he said, no, 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 you're going to get the information. We just want to know why you're using it. And I said, uh, just doing some research. And the person then came back and said, well, we don't have any list of missing people. And I said, well, wait a minute. You guys have a huge law enforcement group. I could go to any small to medium-sized law enforcement agency in the United States, walk into their chief's office, and within an hour, he would have a list of all the missing people in his jurisdiction. Now, you're telling me in your large jurisdiction, you don't have any list of missing people. He said, no. Well, if you go onto the website of the National Park Service and you kind of look around there, they have a lot of lists. One of the more interesting ones is a list of all the movies made on National Park Service property. So they know the importance of keeping lists hmm. and the importance of keeping lists of missing people. And they chose not to give it to us. So I was a published author at the time, and I used an exemption, and I said, I want to use my exemption, and I'd like to get the information from your agency. And I, if you don't have it like you claim... I want you to put the list together for me. So they get back to me later and they said, well, we, we did a little search and your books aren't in enough libraries to qualify for the exemption. Well, folks, there is no such qualifier. It says if you are a published author, this qualifies, period. 
And I reminded them of that, and they said, well, this is just an internal policy we have. So I said, not well, a law. Okay, so let's just pretend that I want to pay for the information. How much are you going to charge me for a list of missing people from Yosemite National Park and then a list from your entire jurisdiction? He goes, we'll get back to you. They get back to me and they said, well, for a list from Yosemite National Park, it's going to cost you $34,000. And if you want a list from the entire National Park Service, it's going to cost you $1.4 million. Wow. What, what kind of uh, justification did they have for that number? None. Uh, they said that they would use an analyst at $65 an hour, and they figured it would take them that long to put it together. Now, since then, I've learned a lot. But shouldn't they just have these lists just available, like, in a database? Like, couldn't they just send you a spreadsheet? <laughs> like, what, is it, what does it take such meticulous mining and paying some specialist? It seems like that's the whole point of keeping these kinds of records, right? Well, exactly. And, and I know that there's – I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to some things. So I reached out to some investigative journalists I know, and I threw this by them, and I said, do you believe they don't have a list? I could not find one journalist that said – there's there's no possibility in this world that the National Park Service police doesn't have a list of missing people in their jurisdiction. Everyone says that they do. They just don't want to give it up. But the the rationale behind this, and since then, this was six, seven years ago now, is I've had several people like yourself step up and say, hey, we will buy the National Park Service a laptop and put Excel on it. And every month, <laughs> there's called a month. There's a monthly report that comes in from every National Park Service property, from their superintendent of the highlights of what happens in that park. Somebody goes missing, somebody gets killed, whatever. Well, they could have an, a, an intern, which costs nothing, screen those monthly documents and put every person's name on an Excel spreadsheet on that laptop. It would essentially cost them nothing. They chose not to publicize this. Now, interestingly, just within the last month, they've started to put one or two people on their website from each park that's gone missing. We're trying to understand the rationale why they're putting those people up as missing, but not the vast numbers that are missing in the park. Namely, the people that they're putting missing are people I've already written about or talked about, but they're not putting up all of them. And, and I don't know why. And it's frustrating because it's such a roadblock to future work. The amount of time and energy we have to expend to find a case that's 30 or 40 years old where somebody's never been found, that energy is huge. But they're forcing us to do it because they won't help at all. And this uh, this investigation, just, just for everyone in the audience, um, when, when we're talking about investigating a specific case, a specific case of a, a missing person, this doesn't just involve, uh, you know, reading newspapers of the time. This also involves heavy research into the staff of the park at the time, the rangers that would be there, any local law enforcement. This can include family interviews. This is a... Uh, exhaustive process. Not to mention uh, any kind of search and rescue efforts that, you know, are deployed as, as depicted in, in your film, um, which I'd like to, to go into maybe a couple of the cases that are in the film. One in particular, the case of a young boy who turned up missing um, and was surrounded mainly by family and I think a, a family friend and his grandfather. And it's, as you described, you know, a very quick disappearance where the, the the child was following his uh, parents to like a fishing creek and then they turned around and, and he was gone and they stayed at the campground for three days with police and you know local uh, citizens um, volunteering to do a kind of search party and nothing came of this ultimately and it ultimately the case was dropped but how how does this why was this case such an interesting one that you chose to kind of feature it as sort of like a bookend in your film um how, how is this kind of like a, an interesting case study of these types of situations so if you if you by chance read five missing persons cases you're, you're probably going to find five sets of circumstances that are totally different without a lot of commonality. Now, you read 5,000 missing persons cases, and soon you're going to see that specific points start to jump out at you. 
and certain commonalities keep replicating themselves time after time. If you look at just one case, like the Kuntz case, your, your intuition may go to, oh, you know, it was a human interaction, it was some type of crime committed against the child by someone maybe at the campsite or someone nearby, I know who did this, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at hundreds of missing persons cases, you see that law enforcement caused pe calls people at the scene suspects many times when they get frustrated that they can't solve it. In the Kuntz case, the child's never been found, and it just so happened that we had a crew up there as this was evolving and occurring. Now, initially, you're going you're gonna to think, well, this isn't so interesting, except there's so many sidelights to a missing persons case that people don't understand, and how law enforcement goes about investigating those cases. And as for me, I was involved in a case in Northern California where a girl disappeared. Well, the FBI was involved, just like they were in the Coons case, and they named the father as a suspect in this case I was, in, I was there on. And it wasn't for weeks until they finally said, you know what, the, the father isn't a suspect. And then weeks later, they end up arresting a suspect, charge him with murder, and he's convicted. So people that are named suspects aren't necessarily the ones who did it. And if they were, they would have filed charges. In the Kuntz case, there's not one piece of hard evidence to point to anyone committing any of this crime. Yet if you look at that case and you compare it to the profile points that we've established in six years or seven years of research, you'll notice that it's a dead-on match. It happens at a remote campsite. The parents state they turn around, the child's gone. They bring in canines. The canines can't pick up a scent. They bring in cadaver dogs that smell the trucks and the vehicles that were at the scene in case they transported a dead body. They can't pick up a scent. All of these things start to lead that, wow, you know what? That's one of the profile points that are established in the missing 411 books. After reading thousands of cases, the handlers bring a dog to the scene. The dog turns around, sits down, doesn't want to leave, can't find a scent. They bring in cadaver dogs. Cadaver dogs look around. They can't find a scent. Uh, the parents say, you know, the child was right here. We turned around and it was gone. Well, it sounds stupid when you first hear that. But the reality of it is it's happened hundreds and hundreds of times if you read the books. And law enforcement, when they get frustrated, they'll say, well, the only thing we can think of is that the parents or the relatives or somebody in the area must have taken the kid. But there's no evidence. And like I keep saying, if you're going to accuse somebody, why don't you arrest them? Because there's no body that's been found. There's nobody that's been arrested. It's a big whodunit. And I'm not going to say that nobody at the scene did do it. I'm just saying right now, I'm, I'm somebody who lives in the world of facts. And there's no hard facts to suspect anybody there of doing anything other than law enforcement calling them a suspect. And they do say, well, you know, they failed the polygraph. Well, I've heard that hundreds of times in other cases where they called other people suspects and they were later cleared. A lot of reasons for failing in polygraph, and that's, a re that's one of the main reasons why polygraphs aren't allowed in criminal court. Yes, it's, uh, I'm really glad that you mentioned that part, David, because more and more, um, I think more and more people are aware that polygraphs are mm, – I. I don't want to say pseudoscience, but there is an inexact science, perhaps an inexact science. There is very there's way more compelling arguments against a polygraph being used because people get nervous. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there are also various ways to uh, trick a polygraph in the worst case scenario. This may be an interesting insight, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the idea that law enforcement might name innocent bystanders as suspects, perhaps out of uh, frustration. And with some of these commonalities uh, that you're describing here, David, that the cadaver dogs catch no scent, the child disappeared promptly, um, we've, we've found some other commonalities that you have listed in the Missing 411 series, and we'd like to explore those in depth after a word from our sponsor. And we've returned.
returned. Uh, before the break, we talked a little bit about the additional commonalities that can be found or uh, profile points here. And in Missing America 411, North America and Beyond, uh, David, we have a we have a couple of commonalities here that I wanted to uh, spend some time asking you about. One thing that really, really stuck out um, both in our interview today and when we had spoken a little bit earlier was that uh, when when children specifically, when, when children have disappeared in various cases, they are they are found in these incredible places or their, their bodies are recovered in uh, places that are extremely anomalous. It, it, could you tell us a little bit about uh, this factor, this phenomenon? Sure. One of, first of all, one of the things that I think the audience needs to understand is the, the vetting factor that we use before we'll even include a case in any of the books or in any of the studies. One of the first things is, is that if there's any evidence of human intervention, an abduction, any criminal activity, we won't use it. If there for adult or child. If it's a voluntary disappearance, meaning mental health is at stake, we won't use it. If there's any evidence of animal predation, you know, animal attack, killing, dragging away, anything like that, we won't use the case. So what we're left with is a series of whodunits. And in 99% of the cases, or more, maybe 99.5%, there's never even a suspect named in the case. The Coons case was one of those weird cases where we happened to be there while it was happening and we filmed it. Now there's another case in the film where a two year old child walking along a mountain trail, supposedly being watched by some friends of the family. He gets out of their sight. He disappears. Four years later, the remains are found 550 feet above the trail. Now myself and a film crew went up there and essentially had to do it on our hands and knees. We probably should have had ropes, it was so steep, to get to the location where those remains were found. Now, when I give a speech in front of a conference, I, I ask people in the audience, I say, uh, so how many of you are parents? And I ask them, if your child at two years old was left in the woods and you walked away, what do you think that child would do? And some of the parents say, well, if at two years old, that child would have played in the dirt and probably gone to sleep right there. Or maybe they would have walked downhill 50, 100 yards, found something interesting, sat down, played, and gone to sleep. Then I ask him, well, how many would have walked uphill? And, you know, hardly anybody ever raises their hand. They say, no, my child, there's no way would walk uphill and exert energy. And then I put a table up that's in one of my books that shows many, many cases where small children are found at phenomenal heights from where they were last seen. And when those children are found, there's no evidence of any animal attack, any human attack. They're just found there deceased. Many times at autopsy, they can't even determine the, ca the cause of death, which is unusual. There's also a table I show phenomenal distances that small children take. And also in the movie, there's a case where uh, a two-year-old disappears in this rural area, and 19 hours later, they're found 12 miles away over two mountain ranges, uh, barely alive, and the person, when interviewed at a small age, of course, they don't remember anything. Now, the reason these are important is, is it's easy for us as adults to understand that small children covering phenomenal distances is highly unusual. Small children going up in phenomenal heights is highly unusual and probably not, not can't, it probably can't occur. So how do they get there? Well, these incidents occur in areas where there aren't other people. It's not like somebody could have taken the kid and done this or carried them or forcibly abducted them. These are in areas that are really remote when these things occur. And there's no evidence. Remember, there's no dogs that can track this because that's the most common profile point. Canines can't track the victim. Or professional trackers that are brought in find no tracks leaving that scene. So how does the victim get from point to point? That's the commonality. 
that nobody can understand. And that's probably one of the most concerning points that I get from readers is how does this happen? And where does this information come from? It comes from search and rescue reports, law enforcement reports, missing person reports, interviews with families, interviews with uh, law enforcement people or search and rescue people. And that's where most of the information gets gleaned from. Dave, in one of the cases that you had just mentioned where the child was carried up to a height that you guys had to travel, uh, use ropes to travel to, in in the film, it mentions that, or at least the law enforcement that was interviewed, uh, they seem to mention that they believed it was an animal attack. Uh, when you're when you're going through and researching these cases, because uh, you guys don't you don't look at cases that are definitely animal attacks. So I, it sounds like law enforcement is trying to make pieces fit um, to to solve a case. Great point, guys. Great point. So initially, when we looked at this case, exactly correct, the press reports, the interviews the sheriff gave said, oh, yeah, it was a mountain lion attack. So initially, we kind of stepped back and looked at that, and then we started to dig deeper. Well, the victim's dad wasn't at the scene and always thought that this was unusual. Well, at the press conference on this event, uh, search and rescue people that had gone up there and recovered the remains had told the father that they found the pants of the child turned inside out at the scene. Yet at the press conference, the sheriff told them, hey, put the pants right side out and let's show them. And when the dad asked the sheriff why he did that, he walked away from the father. So the dad takes all the evidence and all the reports and presents it to multiple mountain lion experts and said, hey, what's your opinion about what happened to my son? And each of them said, well, it wasn't an animal predation case, and I don't know why the sheriff said it. And on all of the clothing that was found, there was no blood on any of the clothing. So the sheriff made a statement to quell the community to make it appear as though they had the answers. And in reality, there were no answers. And you gotta, you got to lean on the experts, and maybe not one. And the father understood this. That's why he went to multiple and independently, they all said the same thing. So, it, you know, that case is a, is a huge who done it. What happened to this child? How did they get 550 feet up the side of this cliff, essentially? Why wasn't there blood on the clothing? Why were the pants turned inside out? Uh, it goes on and on. Was that the case where they also found, like, a single tooth? Yep, they found a single tooth on top of a log. In at about 9,500 feet in elevation, horrendous winters, blazing gales, snow up to 10 feet in that area. How did a tooth get on top of a log and was sitting there? It's also like there's a crime scene photo in the film, and it literally is just sitting there. There's no blood. It looks completely clean. Like, that's just this, this very unsettling. Well, it, was, it was four years later, right? Or something to that effect uh, when the body Correct. was recovered? Um, just just to be devil's you. advocate, yeah, no, no, so yeah. I'm assuming there was there were other animals who came along and took care of the the body. Unfortunately, one interesting factor that's explored um, in in the books as well is the concept of geographical clusters of um, <clears throat> an an unusual number of disappearances happening uh, over time in. Uh, specific regions or areas. Could you could you tell us a, a little bit about this concept and, and uh, how you and your team discovered it? Sure. When, when I was in law enforcement, I worked a couple of big teams that would work serial rapists, robbers, burglars. And one of the things we used was a map, a pin map. And every time a crime occurred, we'd put a pin on the map. And we usually knew that the first crime that somebody did was usually the closest to their home, and they would start to work outwards. And as I started to read through hundreds of reports, a few locations just stuck out in my mind. Hey, I read about this before. And so after a couple of years, I started to have 20, 30 piles of reports in my living room of different locations. And as time went on, certain piles got larger, and eventually I got more piles. Now, I don't like to say this as a concept because I don't deal in concept and theories. Two things you won't find in 
any of my books is any theories about what's happening or any possible suspects as to what did this. Mm -hmm. I, I lay out a series of facts. And facts are the most important thing you're going to read about. And in a lot of books, you're going to hear a lot of wild theories and conjecture. I don't lay that out. I let you come to whatever decision you want to come to. Even though the facts that you read are highly strange, there are factually 59 geographical clusters of missing people in North America that fit the profile points that we laid out. And the biggest cluster of missing people in the world is Yosemite National Park. Now, some people may say, well, yeah, but, you know, that probably has the most visitors. Well, yeah, but if you look at the circumstances that we've laid out for these missing people, I don't care if it's downtown Paris or downtown New York, that's strange that a lot of these people have never been found, even though they disappeared in an area where they should have been found. Canines should have been able to track. There should have been an evidence track or professional trackers to be able to follow these people. Um, these weren't voluntary disappearances. There were no mental health issues. Where are these people? Now, one of the predominant points we haven't talked about yet, but boulders, boulder fields, and granite are somehow involved in this, meaning bodies are found in boulder fields, people disappear in boulder fields or around granite. And that's another one of those points that came out after reading hundreds and hundreds. Well, where's probably the biggest boulder field and granite location in the world other than Yosemite? Hmm. And I know that's strange, but when you look at the surrounding area and how many people have disappeared in and around Yosemite, coupled with other locations in the world that also have these boulder fields or granite, it starts to look odd. Now, if we go back to the Kuntz case, 200 feet from where Dior disappeared is a giant boulder field. And we show it in the film. And it's one of those subtle notes that if you follow the books, you're going to say, oh, yeah, that's right. There is that giant boulder field that no one wants to discuss right above where he disappeared. Now, he hasn't been found, and I don't know the relationship that could be could exist there, but it's there. You mentioned in the film uh, another commonality that we haven't discussed yet, that many of these um, folks who disappeared had some sort of physical disability. Um, can you go into that a little bit? Sure. A lot of times it's not something that's evident. Uh, you, you know, the person isn't limping down the trail. But a lot of times the victim may have autism or dementia. And again, it's not something obvious. And you would say, well, yeah, you know, maybe somebody with autism or dementia, that, that seems a reasonable way to disappear. They did, didn't have all their mental capabilities and they vanished. Again, sticking with those profile points, why can't we track those people down to where they're located? Where did they go? How come they're not found? It doesn't make sense. Now, on the opposite side of that intellectual spectrum, I've also written about people with phenomenal intellectual capabilities that have vanished. One of those subtypes is physicists. There's a series of physicists that have disappeared under strange, strange circumstances and never been found. One of them disappeared in the mountains above Los Angeles was taking a hike with some people on the trail. He didn't feel too well. He stopped, and the person at the back of the line stopped as well with him, and he didn't feel good. So these two guys sat there, and the guide at the back of the line said, well, I'm going to wait a couple seconds. You can go ahead. And this physicist was visiting from Germany, and he took off down the trail, and eventually the guide got back to the lodge, and the physicist wasn't at the lodge. Huge search of the entire area for weeks. The German physicist was never found. And this is another of the subgroups is Germans or people with German heritage seem to disappear at a higher percentage than the norm. But German physicists disappear at a much higher percentage than anyone else in the U.S. And it's a very, very unusual subgroup. I would say unusual for sure. Um I, oh gosh, see, my mind just reels and I want to start asking you about reasons. Like why, why would a bunch of physicists go missing? I, I so badly want to get into some of the allegations and concepts that have been floated to us over the years about these kind of things. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that. So there's been six missing 411 books, about 2,500 pages written. 
And I probably have said this many times in interviews, but if you listen to every interview I've ever done, you're probably going to glean maybe 3 to 5% of what's in the books. And we have a lot of tables, a lot of graphs, a lot of data. We have lists that I encourage people to look at in the back of the books and try to make some sense out of it. And the truth is, is that of the people who have read the six books, and there's been hundreds, if not thousands, tens of thousands, nobody has ever read the six books and come back to me and said, I have the formula. I understand what happened. Here's what it is. Everyone, in, <laughs> I, I could say probably I've had 500 people or 1,000 people write to me in the last three years and say, I've watched all your videos. I know exactly what it is. And then, you know, off the top of my head, I can answer them quickly and say, yeah, but what about this, 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 and this? Oh, I didn't know about that. Or what about this, 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 and this? Oh, I didn't even know about that. And the truth is, is that the people that have read the six books will come back and say, you know, I initially thought that it might have been A, but then this, this, and this happened, and so it can't be A. And yet all the profile points are consistent, so we know that they have to be interrelated. The only thing I will say is that I'm sitting in my room right now looking at the cluster map, is that 80% approximately of all of the clusters are within 150 miles of a huge body of water. Namely, the clusters run from north to south through the Cascades and down through the Sierras on the west coast, and then from north to south along the east coast through the Appalachian, Appalachian Trail, and then there's clusters all the way around the Great Lakes. Now, there's one strand of clusters that kind of goes around the top of Idaho, Montana, and then down through the Rockies, but it's pretty scattered, and they don't have the bulk of the numbers that the east and the west coast and the Great Lakes have. So water is an important feature, and I don't minimize that at all, and I, I think about that all the time. Why are the clusters in close proximity to water, and what's the relationship to that, and why is that so? And then once you look at the cluster map, you'll notice that right in the middle of the U.S., North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, that swath north to south through the middle, or the furthest points from the ocean, have almost no missing people that fit our criteria. It's a very strange sight. So when you start to think about all this, uh, you know, I've had 20 people that have sent me thesis length documents saying, this is what I think it is. But again, it's nobody who's ever read the books. And easily after the first couple pages, I can say, well, yeah, but it's not this because of this, 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 and this. And I don't minimize the people writing in. But you have to understand that unless you read the six books, you're never going to glean all of the options and all of the elements that come into play that do match the criteria. So, I mean, you, you say that it's not your purpose to kind of conjecture of what the what actually is happening here. You're just kind of like laying out some facts and letting the reader make their own assumptions or make their own connections. And in order to do that, you know, you, you kind of need to really dig into the totality of these cases. But I mean, you must have some ideas. I mean, I think, you know, our, our listeners would be very interested to talk about that and to kind of get a sense of what are some of the options here? What, in what realm are we talking about? So if I had a good option, I tell you, and if I heard one out there, I'd tell you. And every time I hear somebody say, well, tell me what you think. Well, I'm interested in you tell me what you think. Because just because I'm a good accumulator of data doesn't mean that I know what all those options are and what, a, what all those options mean. And what I mean by that is that I may be really good at collecting data on missing people siphoning the data, getting it down to a subgroup that all has commonalities. But you guys know that there's probably 50 things in the world that are strange, unusual, and are looked at as predatorial. But each one of those groups has an expert. I'm not the expert on all those 50 areas. I'm focusing in on one thing. Now, if people send me information in and all of a sudden, a light bulb goes off to me and says, this is it. 
well, I'm for sure I'm going to say something, but I'm not going to say something stupid and make myself and my team look like a bunch of idiots just to appease somebody who wants to know my opinion or unsupported look at something. There's no way that's going to happen. That's how people in research lose their credibility. And when I'm dealing with families of missing people, I'm not going to let them go online and look at me saying something stupid and unsupported and then lose my credibility in that world. That's not going to happen. I'm going to, lay, I'm going to continue to lay out the facts. If I find a fact that matches what I'm doing, I'm going to be the first one that's going to step up and scream to the world what's happening. But until that point happens, I'm still doing research. Well, especially considering the way that the national parks, you know, were so hesitant to give out this kind of information. It almost seems like it unsettles people in law enforcement capacity or in, you know, government capacity, like to even consider that there might be some kind of connection in these cases. I just wonder why, you know, if you got such little help from the national parks folks, do you get a sense that law enforcement are also holding something back or not giving you all of the information that they have access to? That's a good question. Um, I think if you watch the movie, you're going to see that there's several different law enforcement people in it. And part of my job is to keep credibility in that world. Because once I lose my credibility, they won't cooperate anymore. Now, just because the National Park Service isn't cooperating doesn't mean general law enforcement won't. And there is a group of people out there that are willing to look at the data and essentially look at facts. And once you delve into it and you realize that, hmm, Dave Politis never said 99% of what is alleged on YouTube and other various sites, he sticks just to the facts. And all these other allegations about he said this or he thinks that, but he's never said it. So law enforcement watches these things, and if some of them believe I said some of these wild things that people allege, they won't want to talk to me, and they won't give me credibility. And it hurts with the victim's families that need help. Now, there is a group out there that knows exactly what I'm about, and they've read the books, and I've given a talk in front of the largest search and rescue organization in the world about this. And at the end of my talk, there were two Alaska state troopers sitting at the back of the audience, and one of them stood up and said, you know, Dave, you're saying exactly what we already know. And we've worked so many of these type of cases, and we have no idea what's going on. But you're saying what everyone doesn't want to talk about. And the guy said, thanks, thanks for talking about it, and he sits down. Now, since that, I've had many search and rescue people contact me and said, you know, that's exactly the truth. This, this is what happened to us on this search. And in fact, in the movie, we interview some search and rescue people that talk about a super strange case. And it's just an example that once you understand what we're all about and you understand that, hey, we're about the facts, that there's a lot more of this going on than we all want to talk about. And the local news probably isn't going to talk about it because it's uncomfortable, but it happens. So it sounds as if um, one, one thing that may be occurring is that uh, individual government employees, like individual rangers or state troopers, are, um, are approaching you and your team uh, with their own experiences, uh, but there's a larger system at play which is much less cooperative. Would you, would you say that's, that's a fair assessment? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, a few times I've talked about this, but um, a friend of mine and I were in a national park and we're at a substation and there's a group of older men sitting around this table talking and you could tell that there were a couple of current park rangers and a couple of apparently retired ones and this one guy was talking at length. And uh, I told my friend, I said, we're going to wait until this guy leaves the room. I want to talk to him. And after about 45 minutes, he gets up and in the parking lot, I approached him and I said, hey, I'm retired law enforcement. And I heard you in there and I wanted to talk to you. He goes, yeah, sure. He explained to me that 
in the Park Service, the detectives for the National Park Police are called special agents. And there's usually about one special agent for every two or three national parks. Yosemite has a couple of special agents assigned just to Yosemite, but normally it's one or two per every national park. And they're like the detectives, and they follow up on cases. And I explained what the national park system had done to me in obstructing us getting data and information. And, and I asked him, I said, can you give me any insight as to why this is going on? And the guy looked at me dead in the eye and he goes, well, Dave, I'm a retired special agent, spent 30 years with the Park Service, and I know exactly what's going on. It's called the lack of integrity. And certain people in the National Park Service Police and in their administration have a complete lack of integrity, and they won't do the right thing. And he says, it's been that way for many years, and it'll probably be that way for many more. And this is not an indictment of the National Park Rangers that the public sees every day. You know, they're, they're great people. They're doing God's work out there. This is a select group at the higher echelon that are making these decisions and making these policies. And when I talked to this retired special agent, we talked for a long time, and it was enlightening because it was his perspective being that insider that this is really what's going on. And then he pointed us to a, web, a couple of websites that were uh, maintained by other park rangers that talked about the discrimination that was going on to them, their inability to get reports when they filed Freedom of Information Act reports. And it was, it was sort of a relief knowing wow, this isn't just happening to me. This is happening to people inside their organization. And if you go to our website, CanAm, like Canadian American, CanAmMissing.com, there's links to all these things, and you can see for yourself that this really is happening. And the Park Service has done a phenomenal job kind of portraying themselves as a holier-than-thou organization that Yogi the Bear is the best friend. But when you look at the underlining of it, it's not anything like the publicity says it is. It's totally different. And with this in mind, we're going to uh, going to explore a little bit about um, various allegations, and we're going to explore the future of Missing 411 after a word from our sponsors. <laughs> And we have returned. So, David, one thing that you said that I think really made our ears perk up collectively is uh, you mentioned that in the online sphere, I guess, uh, that there have been uh, people who are spreading, what would we call it, uh, misinformation or perhaps misrepresenting uh, what this endeavor is actually about. Um, could you could you tell us a little bit about that misinformation? Because we want to make sure our audience has has it clear. Uh, I think we've I think we've outlined pretty well um, some of the the process for which cases to explore, uh, the commonalities right discovered uh the fact that this is aggregation of facts right so what what are these what are these people saying that is misinformation well the number one thing is that i have never and i would never name anything as a suspect or come up with any theory about what's happening unless i could support it 100 percent, and i never have and there's a lot of people that say oh he he said this or he meant that if I say something or I meant something, I just come out and say it. And I think a lot of people and a lot of organizations out there that represent the, the fringe element of cryptozoology or whatever want to align themselves with credible research. And so they want to align themselves with what we're doing in the hopes that it'll give them additional credibility. And the truth of the matter is, if you read the books, you'll know I've never done any of that. And whether it's a lot of people say, well, must, maybe it's a group of National Parks employees or U.S. Forest Service employees that want to discredit me so that the, the mainstream of society won't read what we've put together. 
you know, oh, it's just some kook. He's, he's saying some things that can't be supported. I've yet to find anybody that has ever read the data in that, those books that has attacked us because they read for themselves and they're all listed where we got the sources, where the information came from, and you can go there and read it for yourself. So, I mean, it's thousands and thousands of hours of research and the gleaning of data that has, in, that has taken us to where we are today. Now, why the attacks occur? Well, I, I mean, I've had other investigative journalists tell me, Dave, it just comes with the territory. When you come out with information that makes the Department of the Interior look like fools or makes the Park Service look inept, you're going to get attacks. And it just comes, it, it comes with the territory. I understand that now. I didn't at the beginning, but I get it now. One thing that we always like to investigate or that we feel is part of our due diligence on the show is to look at the allegations, like, as you said, the misinformation, because it's something that stuck out to me. You know, I would see criticism of something on online regarding missing 411, and then I would go back and check out uh, the books I had read. And, you know, honestly, I, I had looked through the books trying to see if there were conclusions. And I can I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that there there aren't. This is a this is compilations of, you know, case research on the skeptical side for the more skeptical in our audience. Uh, one thing that interested me immensely was that I would read these investigations or presentations by, you know, people who would consider themselves the word we keep using is skeptical, more on the skeptic side. And one thing that I thought was pretty fascinating was that most of these people said in in their presentations, you know, they said, uh, we looked at this and these are all genuine disappearances and the facts are all correct. And sometimes quote unquote, internet skeptics do a very poor job of applying critical thinking. So I, I was, I was impressed with that. And it seems like the only real, the only real bone of contention I found from their side was that they were saying they thought there were mundane explanations for these disappearances, but they didn't say what those explanations might be. And so then I started looking at, according to the data we have, what are the most, some of the most common disappearance causes for people who are camping and stuff like that. As you said, a lot of these things don't seem to, don't seem to fit into those easy explanations. Um, are, are you aware of this stuff? And, and how would you respond to, uh, the, to those folks who maybe in our audience or maybe just somewhere out there in the ether who would say that uh, there are explicable causes for this? Well, it, it's hard to respond to something like that on such a general format. If you want to talk about specifics, I'll, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody on any case in any book. But that's a, that's a common trait when someone tries to discredit anything. Well, I think this. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you respond to that? Right, so if, yeah. if we've gone through the vetting process of those points and search and rescue believes that none of those issues are there, then why do you think something different? And I would probably guess that 80% of the people saying these things have never read one book. They've, you know, there's, there's something called plausible deniability and a lot of these people are uncomfortable with where the books may take them because it takes you out of that comfort zone and puts an aura on the wild environment that, you know, maybe this isn't Disneyland when you walk into a national park and maybe you're not as safe as you tend to think you want to be. And if it's not a mountain lion and it's not a bear attack and it's not a human attack and it's not a voluntary disappearance, what does that leave? What what took the person? And how did the person get from this point to this point? And there was an animal predation, and there's no injuries to the body, and blah, 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 blah. Why can't they figure out the cause of death in this case? And you start to think these things, and it starts to become uncomfortable. And I think a lot of people's mentality is 
they need to go to the wilderness to clean their mind. And if I take that away from them, that cleansing and that freedom and that that great feeling they have when they go there, I've taken something valuable from people. And I've heard this before. Now, one of the things I tell everybody is that even though I know what I've written, I still go to the wilderness all the time. And I, I go, but I go cautiously. I never go anywhere alone most of the time, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. If I do go somewhere, someplace alone, I always carry a personal locator beacon. And 99% of the people in my books that I write about would probably still be alive today if they had one. Namely, it costs between $100 and $300. You get lost, you pull the button, it sends a transmission up to a satellite. A satellite sends a transmission to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And they call the local search and rescue where you're at because they have your GPS coordinates now and they send a search party out to find you. In the 1,600 cases I've written about, I only have one case where somebody activated a transponder and wasn't found alive. Only one. That was just outside of Yosemite, and he was found under really weird circumstances. I have never had a case where somebody was carrying a firearm and activated a transponder and was found deceased. I've never had one of those ever. So, I mean, I have a law enforcement background, so I carry a gun all the time anyhow. But I carry a gun, a transponder, a compass, a map. I always tell somebody where I'm going, and I always check the weather before I leave. I think if people follow those easy-to-follow instructions, we could eliminate disappearances by probably 80%. I think that's really, uh, really, really smart. Just just learn what you need to do when you're going to go into the wilderness. Even if you're with another person, just make sure if you get separated, you're going to be okay. It gets a little dicey, though, when you're dealing with like a two-year-old, you know, or a five-year-old. How do you teach your two-year-old how to use a transponder, you know? (laughs) Keep the kid with you. Well, yeah, well, obviously, (laughs) but it doesn't always happen. That's that's true. Um, And this this is a really important point, whether you consider yourself an outdoorsman, a survivalist, you know, or, or whether you think occasionally one day in the future you might go camping. Um... These points are are crucial because I think people forget easily um, how that it's called wilderness for a reason. Mm-hmm. Wild things can occur, and you know, always practice the buddy system. Always have, and as as David said, like always have somebody who is not out in the woods with you, who knows where you're going roughly and what time you're expected to be back. Uh, so, speaking of survivalism. Survivor Man makes an appearance in this movie. So is is uh, Les Stroud somebody you have worked with before in the past? Uh, how did that come about? Les read the books, and he got a hold of me, and he said, Dave, those books were phenomenal. And he goes, you're really onto something. He goes, it's something I've thought about for a long time. And uh, he goes, if I can help you with anything, to promote this safety strategy and the reality of what you've written about, let me know. I'll help you. Well, we got to time to film and we sat around and had a discussion about how we could utilize his his services. And we said, well, how about if we utilize you to try to replicate uh, a path that a two-year-old took through the night to get a certain, to get to a certain location? He goes, I'm on, I'll do it. So we met him and crew went out with him overnight and, yeah, that he he proved to me that there's no way this two year old could have done this, and I don't think that there's anyone in the world more credible or more attuned to the environment than Les Stroud. So I I have never heard anybody who's seen the film and watched that segment that said, oh, you know, that was faked or, you know, everyone says, wow, if Les couldn't do it, this two year old sure as heck couldn't have done it. Hmm. Oh man, that is a great point. So that particular case uh, that he helped out with occurred in the 1950s. One of the other clusterings that we saw are clusterings in time, like specific uh, years where there were a lot of missing persons. Uh, can you go over some of some of those clusters and when they occurred? So all the geographical clusters are there. Now, inside some of those clusters are, are time clusters. And there's certain periods of time in certain areas where 
a, a clustering happened where there were multiple people over a short period of time that vanished. There's some in Michigan, there's some on the West Coast, and unless we laid it out in a list format, it probably wouldn't be evident. And there's also certain disappearance, and somebody found this out and sent it to us, and I can't take credit for it. I, I think it was a guy in Finland sent it to me, and he said, Dave, do you realize that three of the disappearances you've documented occurred when ships and planes disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle? They disappeared on the same day. I said, oh, that's weird. And I looked and ver verified what the guy said and said, it sure is true. So, you know, again, there could be a lot more to these disappearances than coincidence. And when you look at the numbers and you understand that it's just not the U.S. and Canada, but there's nine other countries where this exact same thing is happening. And the top countries besides the U.S. and Canada are Australia and the United Kingdom are the next two. So it's very strange. Definitely strange. Yeah, so David, um, I think we're nearing the end here, but is there anything that we haven't talked about that kind of strikes you uh, as something important for listeners to understand about what, what what drove you to do this project and to continue kind of pursuing these cases? And what's the future? Yeah, and what's next? Well, I think that once you meet these families and you interact with them and you realize that they've been rebuffed by almost every government agency in existence and that after that seven to ten day cycle everyone wants to forget about the disappearance these people feel abandoned and I'm not just talking about the National Park Service I'm talking about the Department of the Interior the US Forest Service it's just not one agency it seems as though nobody wants to even address the topic and if someone's a victim of a homicide or somebody dies from an auto accident, there's finality to it. These people have nothing. They don't know where their loved one died. They don't have the remains they can go and visit. They, they're they left with this open-ended wound that nobody wants to help them close. And you give them a little attention. If you kind of give them a path to get more details, if you let them know that they're not alone, but there's hundreds and hundreds of other families just like theirs that also are being victimized the same way, it, it helps them. And I've seen this happen many times, and being friends with these families is super important to me. And they're all great, great people who are living a life of almost torture. And once you understand that, it hurts. It, it hurts that our government doesn't do more than help them. Now, what's next is uh, research is continuing, and we're learning more things from victims, victims' families, people who have read the books. I always, at the back of each book is my email. I, I tell people to write. I read every email, I, I, everything I get, and I encourage people to give me their thoughts after they read the books. One of the things that we're doing is uh, in October of this year in Denver, we're having what's called the Mile High Mystery Conference. And there's gonna be a lot of people there speaking. And one of the people that is speaking at the conference is Alan Adadero, who lost his son. And Alan's someone who has tremendous insight. He's a high school teacher. He's very, very smart. And he speaks from the victim's perspective. And I think that individuals, once they hear him present, will say, wow, there is really, really something here. If you don't want to believe it from me, hear it from Alan. I'll be presenting there as well as some other researchers, but I think it's going to be one of the first times that the public is going to hear directly from a family member the truth and how they've been misdirected, misguided, and essentially lived years without any assistance. David, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today and giving us a, uh, a in-depth look at a phenomenon that uh, many people, well, more and more people are aware of, but many people may not have been aware of until they heard uh, this 
interview. In the book series is Missing 411, and the documentary is out as we record this episode today. You can get it right now on Amazon Video to stream, or you can buy the thing and have it forever. So, David, thank you one more time for coming on the show and sharing uh, your research with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Guys, I appreciate the opportunity to speak for the families and from, for our research, and uh, glad to come back anytime. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you so much. 